All right, guys, so with Joe Biden deciding to ungracefully bow out of the 2024 election, it's looking pretty solidified that Kamala Harris is going to be the Democratic nominee going up against Trump. Now, I do think on the one hand that Kamala is at least marginally a stronger candidate than Joe Biden, but on the other hand, she's definitely not the strongest candidate that Democrats could have put up. In fact, the only other time that we really saw her participate in some sort of a national election was back in the 2020. Democratic primary where she had to drop out before Iowa because she was doing so poorly. But it seems like, based on what we've seen over the last couple of days, that top Democrats are circling the wagons. She's gotten basically every endorsement you could ask for from establishment Democrats. Um, you know, it seems like there are no real contenders that are even willing to throw their hat in the rings at this point. So I guess it's Kamala, right? And so now the conversation sort of just becomes, who's she going to pick for VP? And what are her chances against Trump? So a couple of different things that I got lined up here for you guys on uh, the latest with the Kamala Harris campaign. So first off, in just the first 24 hours since Biden said he was stepping aside, apparently Democrats with their major super PAC, Future Forward, have raised $150 million. Guys, this is nuts. I mean, this is a, I believe, a historic record for a single day of fundraising. $150 million is absolutely wild. Um, now, we also have to pair this with the story that I covered before of, you know, top Democratic donors basically boycotting, you know, Joe Biden until he decided to step aside. So maybe this is just an influx of money from people who decided, okay, finally Biden is gone. Now I'll get behind basically any other Democrat. That could be part of this. Maybe some of it is people are somewhat generally more excited about Kamala Harris. I'm sure it's a mix of both. But uh, this is definitely uh, noteworthy in terms of the funding gap between the Kamala Harris campaign and uh, Donald Trump. Now, we also had this story that came out here from Mediaite that Kamala Harris is reportedly prepared to clean house in the Biden cabinet, dumping the secretaries of state, defense, and more. So apparently she's preparing to uh, get rid of Jake Sullivan, Antony Blinken, and Lloyd Austin if she wins the presidency. Now, of course, all of this depends on who she would replace them with, but even just getting rid of those guys, I mean, those are three absolute unmitigated monsters, right? So getting them out, is a positive step in the right direction, right? Unless she replaces them with like Dick Cheney. I don't know, which is entirely possible, I guess, right? So I thought this was noteworthy as well. Now, in terms of how she's going to run this campaign against Donald Trump, this is an old campaign ad from when she ran that first failed presidential campaign back in 2019, 2020. And um, it seems like this is kind of basically going to be the gist of how she's going to run against Trump this time around as well. So let's go ahead and watch this ad back from 2019. Sick of this? Well, think about this. He's a world leader in temper tantrums. She never loses her cool. She prosecuted sex predators. He is one. Grab him by the She shut down for-profit colleges that swindled Americans. He was a for-profit college. At Trump University, we teach success. Literally. He's owned by the big banks. She's the attorney general who beat the biggest banks in America and forced them to pay homeowners $18 billion. He's tearing us apart. She'll bring us together. This is Trump. And in every possible way, this is the anti-Trump. So if that's what you're looking for in your next president, there's really only one. Kamala. So there you go. Now... I don't know about the other aspects of this advertisement, but I have seen other reporting recently over the last couple of days that Kamala is going to heavily lean into this whole, you know, former prosecutor versus convicted felon angle, which to me, not the most appealing thing because, you know, you have a terrible record as a former prosecutor in California, as the attorney general, as the district attorney for San Francisco, absolutely horrible record. Uh, from a leftist perspective, but to normies, that actually could be a pretty appealing message, right? Donald Trump, convicted felon, you know, you could go with the whole lock him up kind of campaign like Trump did with Hillary back in 2016. I don't know, you guys tell me, is that the kind of advertisement, that the kind of messaging that may actually work this time around? Now, we also have this update from Kyle Griffin here that according to MSNBC, this is basically the shortlist for who Kamala Harris is considering 
to be her vice presidential candidate. Now, this should be alarming for a number of different reasons. Let me explain why. So, number one on this list is the North Carolina Governor Roy Cooper. Number two is the Pennsylvania Governor Josh Shapiro. Number three is the Arizona Senator Mark Kelly. Number four is the Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer. And number five is the Minnesota Governor Tim Waltz. Now, of all of the people on this list, my personal pick would be Tim Waltz, which you can go and look at his his list of accomplishments on, you know, child care and the minimum wage and a number of different issues that he's managed to get through in a very contested state legislature in Minnesota. So I think that Tim Waltz would be my personal pick. I don't think that he's the likely pick for Kamala Harris. Now, on the rest of these, let's just be honest, guys. She's not going to pick Gretchen Whitmer. Okay, that's just a, a fundamental reality of American politics. They are not going to run a two female ticket. It's just not going to happen. It's going to be a white man. Okay, this is basically the unanimous consensus amongst everybody that she's going to pick a standard white guy, right? So I, it's not going to be Gretchen Whitmer for that reason and also for the reason that I don't think Gretchen Whitmer wants to be her vice president. Gretchen Whitmer has her own ambitions, potentially if Kamala loses this round in 2028 or even further beyond. I don't think that she wants to be on a, a winning Kamala Harris ticket for this round and then also for 2028 and then maybe she'll wait till 2032 or something like that to run herself. I just don't think that Gretchen Whitmer even wants this position in the first place, even though I think she could potentially be the strongest as herself of anybody else on, on this list here. You also have Mark Kelly from Arizona. He's got the astronaut vibe going on and everything like that. He's got decent approval ratings, I guess. But the issue with Mark Kelly is that he was vehemently against the PRO Act, the Protect the Right to Organize Act. And um, there are some major issues there in terms of organized labor in regards to Mark Kelly. There's also the issue that if he, because keep in mind, we have this Arizona Senate election going on right now um, with, with Kirsten Sinema's, uh, you know, basically, you know, dropping out. And so, because of that, this could also screw with, with that situation, right? To have Mark Kelly join as the vice president, then it becomes, okay, well, what the hell is going to happen in the Arizona Senate race? We also have Pennsylvania Governor Josh Shapiro. Now, with Josh Shapiro, this would be a nightmare pick because, number one, he was getting into major beefs with the teachers' unions because he was trying to aggressively push forward with some sort of a right-wing Republican uh, school voucher program plan and uh, pissed off the teachers' unions with that. And uh, more importantly than that, I would say, is that this is a guy who literally compared college students here in the United States on college campuses who were protesting against the genocide in Gaza. He compared them to the KKK. So his views on Israel and Gaza are atrocious, like getting close to approaching John Fetterman levels. I wouldn't put him quite there, but getting close. So if you pick Josh Shapiro and Roy Cooper, that applies to to some extent as well. Like if you pick these guys, you're immediately going to take any wind in your sails out that you had previously. This is just going to immediately piss off and isolate anybody who cares about the genocide in Gaza. So basically my point is, outside of Tim Waltz here, guys, this list is not that strong. And in fact, the, the guys who I think would be the number one and number two are not even on this list. It should be number one, Andy Bashir, who is the Democratic governor from Kentucky. The second pick should be J.B. Pritzker, the big boy himself. Now, part of the reason I say that is because they tend to be more left-wing than some of the other people on this list. Um, part of the reason that a lot of people are saying that Andy Bashir should be the pick is because, number one, he comes from a red state, right, a deep red state in Kentucky, and he's a Democrat, and he, he's very adept. If you go and look at how he's handled, um, you know, uh, aggressive right-wing reactionary legislation on LGBTQ issues and how he's pushed back against that and won a re-election campaign in fucking Kentucky on a pro-LGBTQ, pro-abortion platform... He knows how to handle Republicans and reactionary talking points very well, so I think there's an added benefit with that. He also has a decent record on labor. I don't know much about his positioning on Israel and Gaza, I would imagine, because he's in Kentucky. He doesn't necessarily talk about it that much, um, but I think that Andy Bashir would likely be the strongest pick out of anybody, right? And he, he's also, by the way, the single most popular Democratic governor in the country. I mean, think about that, guys. He's a Democratic governor in Kentucky. And he has the highest approval rating over everybody else, over the California governor, the New York governor. Think of the, the bluest state you could possibly imagine. He has a higher approval rating in Kentucky as a Democrat. That's pretty crazy. J.B. Pritzker, I think, would also be strong. He's decent on domestic issues. He's got, you know, he passes the vibe check. He's a big boy. He could probably body check Trump. 
let's be real guys those should be the top two candidates at least in my opinion and then you can also throw in tim waltz there maybe for extra added measure now i'm not saying those those guys are all perfect or i agree with them on anything i'm just talking about out of the realistic candidates that i've heard floating around those seem to be the best options definitely don't go with josh shapiro definitely go don't go with josh shapiro okay so now we get to this <laughs> because apparently uh just in here from abc news josh shapiro and Mark Kelly are said to be the leading VP candidates for Kamala Harris. So, of course, right? Because, of course, Democrats would finally get a little bit of momentum and then immediately try to crush it. I mean, I guess with Josh Shapiro, you can make the argument that he's from Pennsylvania. So maybe that gives you a little bit of a bump in a key swing state that you need to win the election. But I really do just think that his positioning on Israel and Gaza, his adverse relationship with the teachers unions, I really do think that that would just halt the momentum and the memeing and the the you know support that people are throwing behind Kamala Harris right now. I think that would be a disastrous pick, maybe the worst pick out of any of the names that we just went through there. But of course, that's the one who uh, apparently is the most likely pick that she could potentially make. Now, we move on to this because um, I don't know if you guys have heard, but Benjamin Netanyahu, one of the most, if not the single most, notorious war criminals on the face of the planet, uh, is coming to Washington, D.C. tomorrow, where I'm at. Now, unfortunately, I won't be able to be there because of work obligations. I won't be able to be there on the ground as it's happening, right? I think he's getting there around 11 or 12 or sometime. I'll probably go later in the day if the protests are still happening, but he's coming to D.C., right? Our government, Democrats and Republicans alike, invited him to come and speak in front of our Congress. The guy who is currently facing genocide cases at the International Court of Justice, the guy who's potentially facing uh, arrest warrants coming down from the International Criminal Court, this is the man that we want to invite to speak to our country. And um, so I showed you guys the reporting yesterday that Kamala Harris was basically not going to be presiding over the Senate when BB is coming. Uh, but apparently she is going to be having a one-on-one -on -one meeting with BB and uh, skipping his address. She's expected to tell him to stop the war and the suffering of Palestinian civilians. Now, what does that actually mean? Who knows? I've heard Biden say similar things before. How many times have you heard Biden say that he's in favor of a ceasefire and it's materialized into absolutely nothing? So, you know, I wouldn't I would take that with a grain of salt. Um, again, she likely won't keep Sullivan, Blinken or Austin. And uh, Jim Zogby, who I believe is the founder of the Arab American Institute, says that she has shown a far greater empathy for Palestinians than Biden. So here we get to the complex conversation around Israel and Gaza. Let's just say this up front. Let's just be real, guys. There is no possible Democratic nominee for this election cycle at the top of the ticket who is pro-Palestinian. There is none. They do not exist, right? In a dream world, they would, but they just don't. That, that, that applies to none of the major establishment Democrats who would be floated to replace Biden. So we are talking about degrees of terrible here. We're not talking about degrees of good here. We're talking about degrees of terrible here and also comparing that to what Trump has done and would do for Palestinians, which is to say absolutely nothing. And so it seems like some people are at least opening the door for Kamala Harris to be marginally better or less bad than Joe Biden has been. And I think that that is probably largely true because I don't think that Kamala Harris is ideologically a Zionist in the same way that Joe Biden is. I think that Kamala Harris is much more susceptible to public pressure and to, you know, influences around her. Now, again, greatly depends on what those influences are, who those influences are, but I think she's much more susceptible to potentially being slightly better on the issue. Now, I'm not going to give her too much credit for that because it's pointed out here by uh, Abby Martin. Um, just some reminders on Kamala Harris and uh, where she has stood on Israel. She's a regular APAC speaker. Uh, she compared Selma and U.S. civil rights struggle to her pro-Israel activism, Jesus Christ, she called BDS, or Boycott, Divestment, and Sanction, anti-Semitic, massive red flag there. She co-sponsored a resolution against Obama in support of illegal settlements. There was a former campaign director who said her support for Israel is central to who she is. She hosted a White House event promoting Israel's atrocity propaganda about October 7th. After calling for an immediate ceasefire in March, she clarified that she actually meant Biden's temporary pause, and Biden officials say that there's no dispute on policy between Biden and Harris on Gaza. Now, I actually don't really believe that last one. I think that there is some daylight between them. Of course, you're going to have Biden officials saying she's 100% in line with what the president wants, and I'm sure that to some extent she was 
somewhat restricted on what she could do or say. I mean, she doesn't have the power that Biden does. Like, Biden is directing the Israel policy, not Kamala. So I don't know. I can't read her mind. I don't know exactly what the differences were between them. But I do think that there was some, you know, dispute on policy when it came to that. Now, we also had here from Jeremy Scahill. At an APAC meeting in 2018, Harris was asked why she supports Israel. And she said, quote, it is just something that has always been part of me. It's almost like saying, when did you first realize you loved your family or love your country? It was just always there. It was always there. Huh? So what, what exactly does that mean? I don't know what that means. I really don't. This is like a classic Kamala Harris vague nonsense kind of statement. It was always there. Your love for Israel was always there? What, what does that even mean? Anyways, the point being, Kamala Harris does not have a strong record when it comes to Israel, but again, neither does Joe Biden, neither does Donald Trump, neither would any other of the Democratic nominees, you know, who could potentially replace her. Uh, again, not as if we're going to have somebody who's uh, ready to go and arrest Benjamin Netanyahu when he steps foot on American soil and to impose sanctions on Israel or whatever the case may be, but I'm just trying to describe the, the potential nuances and the differences between Kamala and Biden, which I do think that there could be some there. At least I'll leave the door open for that. So now we pivot to this. Um, which I think is actually a benefit for, you know, a trying to analyze where Kamala Harris is and her chances of defeating Donald Trump, which is that Republicans are absolutely losing their goddamn minds. Republicans desperately wanted Joe Biden to be the candidate that they were running against. I think they were reading the same polls that I was reading, which said that he had almost no shot of beating Donald Trump after that first disastrous debate performance, and honestly, even before that, right? I think they were also looking at some of the polls um, that showed that basically any generic Democrat could do better against Trump than Joe Biden. And so they are losing their goddamn minds and they are desperately now trying to figure out ways to attack Kamala Harris. So we're going to get to some of their um, <laughs> initial strategies for the attacks on Kamala Harris. They are uh, not too strong, to say the least. I mean, I think most of them are actually pretty fucking ridiculous. Um, but first off, Let's just watch Stephen Miller, uh, the Nazi man himself here, give us a little bit of a freakout session over on Fox News um, about how this is rigged and fraud and all of that stuff because uh, Republicans spent all this money running against Biden. Let's go ahead and watch this. They held a primary. People, they had ballots. They filled out circles. They went to the voting booths. They spent money on advertisements. And as President Trump said, the, the, the Republican Party... She spent tens of millions of dollars running against Joe Biden. Now they just woke up one morning and said, never mind, we're canceling the entire primary. We're, we're getting rid of our candidate and we're pretending the election has never even happened. And we're going to let donors handpick a new nominee. They're pub OK, um, so first off, absolutely amazing to see conservatives like Stephen Miller uh, suddenly really caring about the democratic process. Okay, pretty ironic coming from people who are standing behind Donald Trump, a guy who literally tried to overturn the last election when he lost. Okay, now on the flip side of that, yeah, I don't like how this process has taken place, right? In an ideal world, Joe Biden never would have ran for re-election in the first place. We could have had an actual open Democratic primary. That's what should have happened. And if that had happened, I really don't think that Kamala would have won, to be honest. Um, so yeah, I mean, that was, that was definitely a, a screw up. I mean, we could have also had a window of opportunity there to have some sort of a democratic process take place at the DNC convention, right? Um, which now it doesn't look like they're even going to do that. They're saying that Kamala Harris already has the delegate support behind her, uh, to secure the nomination. So to some extent, I almost agree with the fact that, yeah, this was kind of an undemocratic process, but the underlying reality is that again, we didn't have a real democratic primary. So I'm not buying into that argument because if Joe Biden had actually participated in Democratic debates this election cycle against Democratic challengers and opponents, then people may have actually seen how much he had cognitively declined and we could have actually gotten a replacement. So the 2024 Democratic primary was not real, okay? It was never real. It was completely rigged. It was a complete farce from the beginning. So when people make this argument about, oh, you're just tossing aside 14 million votes, I'm like... There, it wasn't a real primary. Okay, let's be real about this, right? So there you have uh, Stephen Miller losing his mind over all of this. Now we got another one here from uh, the End Wokeness account saying that uh, for anyone who still believes January 6th was a coup, take notes. You just witnessed a real one, July 21st. <laughs> so um, storming the Capitol, right, in order to try to keep 
your presidential candidate in power after he lost an election, that's not a coup attempt. But it is a coup attempt to apply massive amounts of pressure on a clearly senile presidential candidate to willingly drop out of the race. That's a coup. I mean, again, it's just, what are we doing here, guys? What are we doing? Pretty weak arguments, if you ask me. But now we get to this, because um, the NRSC, apparently, I don't know if this got leaked or this was uh, you know publicly released as a memo, but the NRSC has released basically their game plan of how they are going to try to attack Kamala Harris. And uh, a lot of this is just, man, they are they are literally, in some cases, grasping at straws. They say, so on energy, that Kamala Harris pledged to eliminate the filibuster to pass the Green New Deal. Was that something that she said in, in the 2020 Democratic primary? Because I highly doubt that that's something that she would actually do if she was the president. Um, or I really doubt that. I mean, most of the things you're going to see on this list are things that are just straight up not true, right? Or, or positions that she held temporarily and then backed off of. The second one here is um, that she planned to unequivocally uh, ban fracking. So first off, both of these two things would be a great thing if she did this. You're going to get rid of the filibuster, which is, number one, incredibly undemocratic, and uh, number two, you're going to do it in order to pass a massive jobs program that is going to address the climate emergency. Oh, how terrifying, how scary. No, that would be fucking great, okay? What are you trying to get me to like Kamala Harris? So on crime, this is the best part, they say that Harris said that it was outdated and wrong-headed to put more police on the street. Instead, she joined the defund the police activists in calling for reimagining of public safety. Guys, you realize that Kamala Harris was referred to as the top cop in California. She was a district attorney. She was then an attorney general in California. This is somebody who, if you're going to criticize her on anything in regards to crime, it would be that she was too tough on crime, right? Prosecuting people for marijuana, uh, withholding evidence um, that could have been used to free people. Um, you know, you want to talk about like her, her record on truancy. I mean, go, also go look up clips of Kamala Harris talking about the phrase, uh, build more schools, not jails, and how much she was vehemently against that phrase, talking about how it's actually desperately needed to, um, you know, dump a bunch of money into new jails instead of into education. Uh, doesn't exactly have the record that they're trying to outline here. They say she also pledged to eliminate cash bail and release criminals to, to commit more crimes. Um, cash bail should be eliminated, by the way, but I don't know if she's actually pledged to do that. Um, Kamala Harris backed a bail fund that sprung a convicted criminal who went on to kill a man. Kamala Harris is open to convicted terrorists being granted voting rights. Kamala Harris started a program to drop charges against drug dealers and give them counseling instead. Based. We shouldn't, we shouldn't be continuing this decades-long, racist, failed war on drugs, okay? On healthcare. Again, Kamala Harris pledged to eliminate private health insurance, which infuriates critical unions. Okay, first off, I'm going to ignore the second part there about the unions, but uh, eliminates private health insurance. She does not support Medicare for All. What are we talking about, guys? She temporarily, back in 2020, ran on Medicare for All and then backed off of it, and that's what led to her collapsing in the polls, Right? So this is not even so she doesn't want to ban private health insurance. What are you talking about? She's not going to do that. Kamala Harris co-sponsored Bernie Sanders' $32 trillion Medicare for All proposal. Guys, Medicare for All is cheaper than our current health care system. It is. It is much cheaper because you're essentially just getting rid of the for-profit middleman that is price gouging Americans. So it's not a question of how much is it going to cost. It's going to be cheaper. It's a question of how do you want to pay for it? Do you want to have a single payer healthcare system where everybody pays in and uh, you know you get healthcare free at the point of service? Or do you want people to be going bankrupt by the millions for the crime of getting sick? That's the question on the table when it comes to Medicare for All, a program that once again, Kamala Harris backed off of, right? Don't, don't exactly know even what her current proposal is on that. We haven't even seen her 2024 platform. Foreign policy, they say Kamala Harris sides with Hamas terrorists. Not Israel. Again, we just went through her Israel record. All of this is just bullshit. I mean, right? These attacks are either they're attacking her on things that would be good if she did them, or they're attacking her on things that she doesn't actually support. And then at the bottom here, we get to the weird section. I mean, it's literally labeled weird. They say Kamala Harris has a habit of laughing at inappropriate moments. She's pledged to ban plastic straws. Again, you guys are literally grabbing at straws at this point. Kamala Harris is in favor of banning certain behaviors like eating red meat. No, she's not. <laughs> that's just, that's not a thing. That's not real. She doesn't want to ban red meat. What are we doing? Kamala Harris loves Venn diagrams. That's true. That is true. That is on video. Kamala Harris loves electric school buses because she went to school on a school bus. All right, that's a fair one there. 
Um, she recently discovered that electricity doesn't smell. Okay, so, I mean, again, out of all of these, they're, they're either not true or they're attacking her on things that would actually be good and popular, or they're just making fun of her because she's, she's pretty fucking weird, right? Now, we also had um, a couple of things here in terms of some of the attacks on her in, in the weird section of that. Again, libs of TikTok here saying they want this woman to be president, right? So you would anticipate that in this video, there is going to be something Kamala Harris says that is just like psychotic or crazy or, um, you know, uh, evil or bad or something like that. Guys, I'll put this on low volume here. It is literally... <laughs> it's literally just a clip of her awkwardly laughing. Poor hubby. Poor hubby. <laughs> this is it. It's just a laugh clip. What do we... What? This is the attack? This is the line that you guys are going with? Granted, it's a weird laugh right? It's kind of off-putting. She laughs at weird times that don't make sense. But like, is this the strongest attack? She's got a weird laugh? I don't know. That doesn't seem like uh, the strongest thing. I mean, she also does have like this, this, you know, kind of like wine mom energy about her that, that could be beneficial to some extent, electorally to normies, I think at least. And definitely attacking somebody for laughing and smiling is, is not going to be that appealing to normies, right? Now, we also have this here from uh, the infamous Laura Loomer, now, this is where it gets real psychotic, guys. She says, It's time for Republicans to start talking about Kamala Harris's sexual history and the reason why she likely doesn't have any children of her own. I'm willing to bet that she's had so many abortions that she damaged her uterus. What the fuck? A woman who has no biological children of her own should not be allowed to make decisions in the White House for your children. Republicans need to run with this messaging and ask why a woman of no kids of her own and, a, and just a scarred up uterus is so obsessed with wanting to kill your babies. Oh my god. Okay, so, I, like, on the one hand, I almost hope that you guys keep going with this line of attack, because, again, it is so off-putting to regular people that you guys are just going to come across, like, complete psychos talking about a scarred uterus in order to attack Kamala Harris because she doesn't have kids. What the fuck? I mean, this is the kind of shit that you really get an insight in terms of how, um, you know, how in a bubble many of these Republicans are. Like, they have just truly lost the plot, thinking that this is something that would be a benefit to them, electorally. Now, one final thing here. Real incredible stuff watching Republicans go after Kamala's sexual history while running a, ca a candidate, Donald Trump, that was an Epstein client. Yeah, not, not exactly sure if this is the angle that you guys want to go with. Talking about sexual history when uh, Trump was a well-known affiliate of Jeffrey Epstein. And also Trump donors have also been affiliates like Elon Musk. But, I mean, there you have it, guys. I know this was a long one. I kind of crammed together um, a couple of different videos into one there. We got Kamala Harris with some record fundraising. We have her potentially wiping out some of these State Department ghouls that are currently in the Biden administration. We have her meeting with Benjamin Netanyahu uh, tomorrow or in the next couple of days. And it will be interesting to see what comes from that and if there is any real daylight between her and Biden. But um, yeah, I mean, not an ideal situation. We'll have to see how, how you know she picks her VP. If it's Josh Shapiro, then she's shooting herself in the foot. If it's Mark Kelly, I mean, maybe that's slightly less bad, but still kind of an iffy pick there. You got to go with Andy Bashir or J.B. Pritzker or Tim Waltz. It's got to be one of those guys, um, or I think it's genuinely going to be a mistake. But you guys let me know what you think. And um, yeah, unfortunately, in the uh, immediate foreseeable future, we are going to have to keep talking about Kamala Harris. Politic guy has the best politic. Believe me, no one does it like him. Believe me, everyone is saying things.